Good afternoon, everyone. It's 4 o'clock, so we're going to start. And welcome to um, the Applied Behavior Analysis. OK, we have two guest speakers today, Wendy Miller and Desiree Testing nowak Both, uh, they were just in the session last time. Wonderful presentation. Wendy graduated from Stephen F. Hostin and holds a special education teaching certificate. She has over 13 years experience working with special needs children with an emphasis teaching communication. She has, um, she is a certified Crisis Prevention Institute nonviolent crisis intervention instructor providing training to district personnel. In 2015, Wendy partnered with Desiree to provide an array of services to families with special needs members. And Desiree graduated from Baylor University with a degree in special education. She is a board certified assistant behavior analyst and has over 15 years experience working with children and adults with special needs. In 2015, Desiree founded NOAC Consulting LLC partnering with Wendy to provide an array of services to families with special needs members. Please welcome Wendy and Desiree. Wendy and I'd like to thank you for attending today, especially because we're late in the afternoon on a Friday, so <laughs> we know with training or as well, we start dragging, but enjoy your coffee and your snacks, and um, we'll get started on applied behavior analysis. I will share that um, just a little bit about myself on top of the bio that was previously shared is that um, I taught, um, I have 18 years of experience in special education, and um I taught in South Lake Carroll for five years in a preschool classroom, and um, on my second year, we were slammed with a lawsuit because in 2001, um, parents were doing um, applied behavior analysis in their home environments, and they were seeing research that showed that children were making advances uh, using this approach, um, and it was because of a group of parents that got together and met with our director that we were allowed to um, go receive training about applied behavior analysis. However, now I'm in the private sector so I can talk about this, but we weren't supposed to really share that with families. Um, so we were sent to the training to get the information and to, to know about it, but we really weren't gonna talk about it. So I had families who were asking me, you know, if we were using it and if we were doing it. And I really, really enjoyed the training I did with Dr. Vince Carbone. Um, and that's where I did my actual education work, and he's huge in the field and research of um, applied behavior analysis in New York. And so <clears throat> when I started my training, um, I, I just really saw how effective it was in the classroom as a teacher, but it's hard work. And so I would always say as I started becoming a teacher trainer, as Wendy knows, is that you can't be lazy and do applied behavior analysis. And so... Um, I saw the effects that it had on my students, um, and it was great. And then what happened was the following year, we got a new director of special ed, and the parents met with that director, and she decided that, you know, we need to be doing what's best practice and what research says. And so at that time, um, I pursued um, to work on my board certification and um, become certified and so um, by doing that I became a behavior specialist and a teacher trainer in applied behavior analysis and um, working with a clinic in Austin for many several years with Kelly Woodrich and teaching teachers how to use ABA in the classroom um, and also working with parents as well and continued with NOAC Consulting now um, that we help parents learn how to do it in, the, um, in their home environments and how to advocate for their kiddos as well in the school environment. So just a little history about applied behavior analysis and just about me. 
So let's start with what is ABA? What is Applied Behavioral Analysis? Well, <clears throat> ABA is a science, and that is, that is what it is. It is a science of human behavior that began over 80 years ago with the work of John Watson and was continued by B.F. Skinner. The science of applied behavior analysis began actually with organisms. Then it was also then transferred and used on to animals and then to humans. Applied behavior analysis did not start with children with disabilities or even children with autism. So it's interesting that now it is paired and there is current research that shows the effectiveness and we'll talk about that. But applied behavior analysis has been around for a very long time. ABA has become the best practice for teaching children with autism in the last 30 years, but it's not limited to those that do not have autism. And that is one thing as both as a teacher and as an advocate is that, you know, we're not just using what best practice is for a certain disability. All disabilities should be created uh, not created, but treated equally. And so for best practice, for if it's best practice for children with autism, but I have a child that has Down syndrome or a speech impairment, and it's an effective teaching method and research shows that it is working, then it should be used for my child as well. So it should not be limited or discriminated to only. Applied behavior analysis is the use of techniques and principles to bring about meaningful and positive change in behaviors. Applied behavior analysis has had a bad reputation because the early works and research showed that some punishment procedures were done. And there were also programs that were designed that were very abrupt. Um, and, you know, it, again, it did have some great um, benefits and gains as far as the research showing, but it could also get kind of just a bad reputation of, you know, I really didn't like how they were doing all these trials. I didn't like how they were doing these drills. I didn't really like, you know, this uh, saying things over and over and over to my kiddos. And so it really, you know, is important to know if you are looking in a ABA program or looking at studying applied behavior analysis is looking at what are they doing currently because research has come a long way and it's not that we you know don't um, you know respect the work of those early researchers but there's a lot of current research and changes. Through decades of research the field of behavior analysis has developed many techniques for increasing useful behaviors and reducing those that may ca cause harm and interfere with learning. Applied behavior analysis though not only will help in behavior reduction and also increasing appropriate adaptive behaviors, but applied behavior analysis can be used in other areas as well, not just for behavior, especially with communication. Because what we'll talk about later on in this series is that behavior happens for a reason, and a lot of times we need to look at what that reason is, and a lot of times it can be for communication. So why is it used? Children with autism and also other developmental disabilities do not learn naturally from the environment that just typical learners do. So we need to break down that, uh, those skills in the language and teach them directly and with repeated trials until they have learned how to learn. And when I say repeated trials, this could be for some kiddos that could take two to ten trials. Some kids, it could take a hundred trials of practice. That doesn't mean just sit in the chair, sit in the chair, sit in the chair, sit in the chair all day, but just that throughout the day we're setting up in a classroom hundreds of opportunities or now in my, in <clears throat> our now business, you know, several opportunities in a three-hour time period that they're with us to hit those targets that we're really working on. Um, and then Dr. Mark Sundberg, um, who actually said this quote, um, he is great in the field of applied behavior analysis and has assessments as well um, to use with children and young adults. Um, ABA has 30 years of research and peer-reviewed journals to support uh, the efficiency of the science in improving treatment outcomes. And there is a lovely picture of Mr. B.F. Skinner. Hold on just a second. Get on the right page here. So I really like a lot. Okay, so B.F. Skinner is a huge foundation of really resurfacing applied behavior analysis um, after years of research and it just kind of just sitting on shelves getting dusty and dirty. And when B.F. Skinner started really looking at behavior and also language functioning for reasons, and really look at the environment and how we can change the environment and shape the environment, it really just made advances um, in the field. There are several quotes that 
I really enjoy that B.S. Skinner will share, but this is a very just easy to understand and easy to read is that all we need to know in order to describe and explain behavior is this. Actions followed by good outcomes are likely to reoccur. Actions followed by bad outcomes are less likely to occur. And that's just in life in general. And so when I said, to, you know, using applied behavior analysis for just children with autism or those with disabilities, that it's not true. It's used in a lot of other fields as well. So we want to first define what is behavior. Behavior is the movement of the body's muscles and glands. And it is what we see with our eyes and we hear with our ears. And it is measurable. And so when I say behavior, a lot of times everybody thinks, like I said, problematic, maladapt maladaptive behavior. But behavior can also be appropriate behavior. It can be adaptive behavior. You know, how often are they on task? And what does that behavior look like when they're on task? Now, feelings and emotions are a private event which are not measurable. So I can say in the field of behavior analysis that um, some people will say, well, y'all just don't understand. You're not taking in, you know, to, uh, that, to understand that feelings and emotions do play a part. But that's not what we're saying. We recognize we all have feelings and emotions. However, I'm not a doctor, and I can't jump into your body and jump into your gut or jump into your head and know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. So I can't measure those internal behaviors. However, you may engage in behaviors that tell me I'm tired because you're yawning. So even though you haven't told me you're tired, and I don't necessarily know you're tired, but if you're yawning or stretching, okay? So maybe those are those behaviors that I see with my eyes and my ears that tell me, yeah. Or we see kids engaging in behaviors that they don't typically engage in, and our radar goes off saying, you know what? This is not typical. They might not be feeling good, and these behaviors are communicating that they're not feeling well or something's not right. So like I said, there's two ways to look at behavior. Adaptive behavior, follow. So these are just some examples of some appropriate behaviors. Following directions, appropriate communication skills, social skills, play care, uh, I mean not self-care, and then play skills. So there are many, many good behaviors that we want to point out. What can our child do, our young adult do? What are they able to do? And then maladaptive behaviors. They could be throwing items. It could be inappropriate verbal skills, whether it's screaming, hollering, yelling, spitting, scratching, hitting, aggression to others, and then noncompliance. And some, for some people, noncompliance is just the form of just sitting in the chair not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I think a lot of times people think, oh, problematic behavior has to be very intense. It has to be like self-injurious. It has to be like aggression and they're hitting in themselves. Not necessarily. Maladaptive behavior could just be the simple fact of I'm just not doing what you asked me to do. So behavior functions for a reason. And in the school setting and also in private settings, the what is done is a functional behavior assessment, and that is to be done to determine why the behavior is occurring. Because we can sit here and talk about, yes, you know, Johnny is hitting, but until we know why Johnny is hitting, we can't look at interventions and be able to treat Johnny without knowing that. So what, what bad um, teaching used to look like is that, all right, any kid who hits, you know, goes to the principal's office, or any kid who hits, they have time out. Or any kid who hits, you know, they're going to be suspended. Well, the problem with that is that's treating the behavior by what the behavior is. We call that a topography. So we're just looking at if you hit, then this is what we do. Well, the problem is why Wendy may hit and why Desiree may hit could be totally two different reasons. So we need to really look at to identify that target behavior, but find out why, you know, what is the cause? Because my, uh, a colleague of mine that I worked with, we would share this in training, is that her son, he got in trouble for doing some bad things at school, and then they suspended him. And she goes, oh, great, Desiree. He's going to love this because he doesn't have to be at school. I mean, this wasn't a punishment for him at the time. He was like, woohoo, I don't have to go to school for a week. Cool, you know. And so it, did, it, was, it was silly. I mean, we, it, us knowing behavior, we're like, again, you can't just look at it as, you know, what works for everybody, and we're going to treat everybody based on that behavior. 
So what are those functions of behavior? And so I could use a scientific term of socially mediated positive behavior, and it's socially mediated positive um, behavior would be to gain access to an item or to gain attention and interaction from others. So we find in both education and also in our other private setting is that a lot of our students, young adults, clients, their behaviors are functioning to gain access to something that they want or need or because they want to access attention, but they're doing it in a maladaptive way, a problematic way, okay? Um, a second function is to avoid a request or an activity that is unpreferred. That is another Another huge function that is typical with our population is that I simply just don't want to do it. I don't, I don't have an interest. And we have to recognize that what motivates someone doesn't necessarily motivate, you know, our kiddos. And so just because I know that by completing, you know, a directive, you're going to be happy and give me social reinforcement, well, that's not so much the case. Our kids may not be motivated by social reinforcement. So they're not just going to want to do it just to please someone. Um, and that would be called socially mediated negative reinforcement. Um, the third function, which is called scientifically automatic reinforcement, is because it feels good. So they do engage in behaviors, a lot of times they're stereotypical or they're repetitive behaviors that feel good to the individual. Now, I will point out that just because a student engages in repetitive behaviors does not mean that they're doing it as a feel-good. That's the same as me talking about hitting and saying just because they hit, they're doing it because of this reason. I learned this when I was starting to do my certification. I was doing lots of observations and lots of assessments. And I just assumed because the student was rocking that it was to feel good as a self-stimulation. Well, when my supervisor asked me to set up conditions, to analyze the behavior, what I noticed is, is that when I attended to someone else in the classroom, the student was rocking repetitively. And also, when she asked me to place demands on the student, he then began to rock. When left alone in a condition that was reinforcing, he didn't engage in the behavior. Typically, someone who is doing a behavior that feels good, if they can do it without you present. The first two, to gain access and attention, somebody that has to be present for this to be a function. Also, to avoid a request or an activity, someone has to be present. But for this third, feel good, no one has to be present. This would be, again, I could be alone in my room, I could be in the bathroom, I could be all alone, have everything that I need around me, but I still engage in this behavior because it feels good and self-stimulates me. They don't need me for that. And then the fourth is for pain attenuation, and that there are those who engage in behaviors um, to relieve pain. Um, and so that is treated medically. And then just an example of that, a couple of examples would be, for example, you get a, a mosquito bite. And what you do as a result is you itch it because you think, you know, that that's going to make it go away. But actually it really doesn't, but we still do it. Um, because it, you know, at the time maybe it's relieving that pain or maybe I'm going to get a headache and I start to press on my temples because I want to re release some of that tension or kind of got massage back on my neck where that tension is or just simply take a Tylenol. That would be because I want to relieve from pain. But those things are medical and they're not treated except through medical, um, through a doctor. So in our environment, which is our, our, our practice and in the education before, uh, field is that the top three would be the functions that we're looking at the most um, with our clients. But I will say that um, I've had a student, uh, I had a student for years that I worked directly with that um, would hit her nose so hard she ended up breaking it five times. Just because she was hitting her nose so hard, that doesn't mean because we think, ouch, pain attenuation. I would think that would be for pain. No. It was tested multiple times and experts brought in that it was due to escaping and avoiding demands and requests. So just because it looks like, oh, I, she must be doing that for pain. And we even have students that will engage in eye gouging, and you would think the same thing is, why would they do that? Because that would hurt and that would be painful, but they're not doing it. We have some students with visual um, impairments, and they actually do eye gouging because it's a part of their disability and it's a feel good for them.
what we thought would be very helpful today is to go into some scenarios because as we are going to have time for questions and answers, um, ethically, we can't have questions that say, well, my child does this and what would you recommend I do? Because ethically, without me directly observing the behavior with that, with that child, I cannot make recommendations, but I want to help. And so the best way we thought we could help is to get an idea of what are some typical situations and scenarios that are you know, happening in the home or what are happening out in the community, and then walk through how we would teach someone to respond to those interventions. And please keep in mind that these interventions and the do's and don'ts that I'm sharing, they're based on the science of applied behavior analysis. So they're going to be based on, I have analyzed this behavior as an expert, and I know why this behavior is functioning and what it's functioning for. Therefore, the treatment is aligned with the function of the behavior. All right, so starting off with do's and don'ts. So here's scenario one. Johnny remains sitting on the floor when told to come to the table. So we can just think about this hypothetically. You can just think, okay, I, I just you've asked, basically, you might not have this exact scenario, but you can think, okay, I'm asked to do something, but they're not doing it, okay? That's the whole kind of idea we're going at here is that you're asked a directive, you've been asked to do something by an adult, and your behavior is you're not doing it. So what do we do? We want to expect them to do what we asked, okay? And so that could look like prompting. A lot of times prompting procedures are great for getting um, students and young adults and child to comply. So that could be even a gestural prompt, another verbal prompt, some even physical, full physical prompts are needed or partial prompts but they need to follow up with what you've asked them to do. Repeat and keep the demand. This doesn't mean that you have to just keep saying over and over, come to the table, come to the table, come to the table, come to the table, come to the table. You can take breaks in between that. There can be pauses in between that. There can be even silence where you're just pointing, come to the table and keeping that demand. We don't want to remove the demand. If we remove the demand, then it reinforces that they got out of the directive. So I already talked about prompting. So what we don't want to do is we don't, at this time, want to rationalize, why are you not coming to the table? And, the, and what I tell teachers and parents and, and all the trainings that I present is that when you're treating behavior, I, I'm, I'm a fan of communicating and talking, but that's what we do proactively. That is a proactive before behavior occurs. And as my supervisor for years said, we strike when the iron is cold, not hot. So it's thinking of we're teaching when we're on, okay, when things are good, when we're complying. But when things get hot like this, this is now we're treating. So we're so this isn't a teachable time to, okay, let's go back and let's re, you know, talk about it and rationalize that. And all that does also is it just makes a longer duration of the compliance to happen. It's called, it will just postpone. It will just postpone what you really want them to do. We don't want to use bribing that, come on, if you do this, this will happen. I am a huge fan of reinforcement. It's a huge part of behavior analysis. So what I would recommend is if this is a problem, that you use that reinforcement before you get the behavior. So if you know, all right, I'm about to ask him to do something, I'm gonna whip out the M&M, &M, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a, I mean, unless it's a dietary allergic problem, I say use what works. I've worked with teachers in middle school that said, I'm not going to give them goldfish. That is so childish, and I'm not going to do bubbles. And I'm like, then you're not going to change behavior because it has to be what reinforces them. There will be no motivation to change if you don't use and pair reinforcement. So always use that before. Okay, so, you know, first come to the table. You can use those first thins. First come to the table, then you get M&Ms. But once they're on the floor, or they're not coming, or they're yelling, it's not okay to start waving the M&Ms, okay, and saying, come on, come on, come on, if you do it, you get this, 
Okay. You're just setting yourself up to it's going to happen again. And there, you know, you're pairing that I'm reinforcing the wrong behavior. You know, you want to reinforce the good behavior. Think of it that way, right? What did B.F. Skinner say? You want to reinforce the good things. So when they're at the table, that's when you get good things. When you're on the floor, mm, no, I don't want to reinforce that because I'll get more of it. So don't do that. Um, and, don't, and don't go do it for them. Um, I tell parents a lot of times, I know, I, and, I, and I say it to teachers, I say it to staff, it's effortful. It's effortful and can be very hard work and exhausting. But don't just go do it for them because they're not going to learn the skill that we're wanting them to learn. So in saying that it's effortful and the durations can be a long time, don't give up. Don't give up because the research shows that this stuff works. And it's important to really remain calm and use a neutral tone. And that's hard. That is very hard. Um, I have a lot of expressions. I, I mean, people can read me. I can do neutral, though. And I know when to turn it off and to do neutral. But sometimes those emotions, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? It is 5 o'clock. I mean, so they're real. But if you need to walk away, walk away. I tell teachers all the time, let me take over for a while. Walk away. Walk away. Go get a drink. I mean, it's not ideal to walk away, but I'd rather you be calm and not, you know, losing it. <laughs> So just remember, you know, just to, and to, and to keep a neutral tone um, as you're running an intervention. Another scenario is Johnny throws his shoe when he is told to put it on. All right, so what do we want to do? We want, ex again, you're going to see some patterns here. Expect him to do it. Okay, he needs to put his shoe on. Again, we're going to repeat and keep the demand. Again, using those pointing cues, soft, calm, neutral tones. Also keep a safe distance. If you have, you know, if you are working with somebody who is aggressive, um, make sure your proximity. I'll just be honest. I mean, sharing helps people learn. I've been in a lot of homes. I've been in a lot of classrooms where my simple advice, being the expert, was get out of the way. I mean, seriously, get out of the way. You're getting hurt. Or the other is, move. I mean, we, we've been in so many positions where we see people taking the hits, you know, and taking the things being thrown at them. And it's like, you need to protect yourself. You need to have that proximity. Get out of the way. If you've already been hit once, go ahead and back up and separate yourself from that. You can still be telling them that they need to go get the shoe, but you don't have to be standing so close to where you could put yourself in danger. Don't rationalize again. This isn't the time. Again, strike when the iron's cold, not hot. Don't change your request. Your request is your request. Or go get the shoe, again, doing it for them. And so, as I emphasized about your safety and when um, the introduction was being shared about Wendy being, you know, trained in the nonviolent crisis intervention, um, it was really great because, you know, we would learn how do you appropriately get out of these situations? How, how do you protect yourselves? What if you get stuck in a hairlock? What do you do? So there is training out there for, you know, it, those intense cases like that which in my field, I get it, I was getting it, you know, certi not certified, but re-done um, every year because I work with a lot of kids with violent behaviors. Um, and now Wendy's going to take over here. Thank you. I think, um, again, it's great to walk through some of these scenarios, and even though they might not be identical to what you're experiencing, I think you can um, interpret them, and then, of course, we'll try to answer the questions as ethically as we can for you. So, in this scenario, Johnny throws his toy when Mom is talking to his brother. So, again, we're not going to just look at what happened, the toy going across the room, but to understand why it's happening. In this scenario, I understand it's probably functioning to get mom's attention. He might be wanting mom's attention, may not have the skills, the verbal language, or um, a better adaptive way to request it. 
So because he wants your attention but is not requesting it accurately or appropriately, continue your conversation. You're aware of what happened, but you are choosing, this is what we call planned ignoring. You're not ignoring him all day, but for this scenario, you're gonna wait and wait for him to be appropriate. Perhaps he's turned back to another object close beside, he's engaging in that. During that time, you've finished talking to the brother. You now see Johnny being appropriate. So um, you talk to Johnny when he's appropriate, give him the attention at that time. Because again, if you reinforce attention when you threw an object, you're gonna get more thrown objects. All right, another scenario with his brother. Johnny grabs the toy from his brother. A lot of families will rationalize that that's just what they do. And again, you don't have to uh, accept that that's the best possible behavior. So you don't ignore the situation. You don't allow Johnny to continue to play with the toy and you don't rationalize and go into that long speech. That is not the time to be, rem remember Johnny, we're not gonna be grabbing, it's, that is not the teaching time. What you do is you walk to the area, you prompt Johnny to give back the toy, and if necessary, you might scoot Johnny over six inches just to be a little bit out of reach. It doesn't have to be removing Johnny from the room. This is another scenario you might have some experience with. Johnny is jumping up and down repeatedly while watching his favorite show. Desiree alluded to a scenario like this where they're engaging in a behavior whether you're there or not. For some reason, this is an automatic positive. That's something that feels good to them that they would engage in whether they're alone, they have all their toys, treats, favorite items. Um, what you don't wanna do is ignore the situation. Don't make a conversation about it, and don't allow the behavior to continue. It used to be thought that it was okay to allow this behavior to occur when they were on their own, that it met a need, but it actually gets worse. It doesn't improve their behavior. They'll just engage in it more frequently and for longer durations. So when you see that, you walk to the area and you tell Johnny to stop. Um, if they don't stop after that time, you might just gently touch them to prompt compliance. So just put a hand on their shoulder. Um, again, if they'll respond to stop, that's all you have to do. All right, now this is a little more uh, safety focus. While at the grocery store, Johnny runs away from you towards the exit door. Again, want to emphasize safety is always paramount, both your safety and your child's. So do run to the area, yell stop, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> if you're with another adult or perhaps there's another shopper next to you, um, you can even ask them to alert store management. They can temporarily shut the doors to help prevent exit, especially into a parking lot or busy area where it would not be safe. Um, a lot of stores have a term code Adam. They know uh, what that means. So as you get close to Johnny, block him from running. That again, you might just be able to position yourself in front of him. Um, and once stopped, you would probably ask for help to retrieve your items. Chances are you have left your handbag, left whatever. You might have to physically drop and run because his safety is paramount. You don't want him um, being in danger. At that point, you would walk Johnny uh, to the vehicle and leave after you've gathered your personal items. Um, I think, as you know, you would not ignore the situation and just hope that they return. You don't want to think, oh, they're just doing it for attention, and they said, I shouldn't be attending to this behavior. Um, safety's first. <laughs> you go get them. Um, don't come back and resume your shopping, and don't worry about leaving your merchandise. Um, and just, again, your struggles are real. Don't worry about what people think. You need to respond. Uh, for their safety and you know um, 
better than those onlookers around you. Um, there's another scenario I think a lot of uh, children with this syndrome might uh, engage more in just kind of the wandering away. Um, so it might not just be fleeing, but it's the same pr principles here. Uh, safety first, get them, redirect them uh, to where they should be. All right, now several things. We've moved pretty quickly through this, again, just to give you some highlights and to allow some time for questions. But don't forget several key points. Catch him or her being good and deliver reinforcement. That reinforcement is what is reinforcing to the child. It could be edibles. It could be verbal praise, tangible items. It could be social interaction, whatever is important in their world. And just like you and I don't want criticism, frequently we need all the good positive reinforcement. So do our children, whether they're a special needs individual or not. So I would stress this one the most is catch him being good as frequently as you can. Good job coming to the table. I like the way you shared your toy. Even just looking when you call their name. Just whatever you can, you can find something positive. Uh, do take the time to take reinforcers into the car and community. Uh, for a lot of our special needs individuals, the community is the most difficult place to be successful. Uh, so you need to go prepared. Uh, take those with you so that not only you can keep them occupied, but also reward the appropriate behavior when they are being good. Maybe they are now able to be in a restaurant and you wanna reward that and reinforce that. You know, to allow extra time. You know their history. Do they have a history of engaging in problem behavior during transitions? So I know we all live a very fast-paced life with a lot going on and a lot to juggle, but if you can allow those extra 10 minutes, the extra half hours you're getting ready to go, that will make your life easier. It will help you remain calm and more neutral in the situation. Take time for yourself. Um, Naturally, you are very focused. You wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case to provide everything you can for those around you with uh, the Fella McDermott syndrome, but yourself, your needs, those of your partner and other children are equally important, and so take time for those and develop um, those relationships, and that will all work together to provi provide the best possible environment for your youngster, so that I believe it's the brief history. Here's our website, noatconsulting.com. We will have additional resources online. We are also available to consult with families as they have needs, um, either for working with the schools or just in their family situations. Um, so at this time, let us know if you have any questions. They'll walk around with a microphone. Um, one of the parents that had to leave had this question. She wanted to know the cognitive age of those examples because we have um, children with Phelan McDermott syndrome have a different cognitive age. And so is that, what do you think? Well, the way that um, we treat behavior isn't actually based on age. It's based on that assessment. So I would kind of need a little bit more information not their age, specifically their cognitive age, their ability to understand, so. Correct. So um, less is best as far as the verbiage of talking, okay? And that is one thing that's feedback is that a lot of talking can be overwhelming, especially cognitively if they're not understanding, you know, and receptively understanding what's being said to them. So less is best. Um, but as far as them understanding, the science shows that these repeated trials, they'll learn to learn. And so we may think they're not going to get it, but after time and multiple trials, the research shows that they will. Um, and also what I want to say is we didn't have you know, we had a limited time to, to, uh, to talk about ABA and we really um, emphasized on behavior, but ABA can, is used to d just have good teaching strategies and how to, you know, 
get your kid to be successful or young adult to be successful. So it doesn't necessarily just have to do with behavior. It has to do, and I know a lot of parents had said, nonverbal and communication, ABA, uh, there's so much research on how to use applied behavior analysis to increase language. And even if you're not increasing verbal language and, and verbal behavior, everybody thinks verbal language is language, like spoken language. But also there's verbal behavior. And verbal behavior is just how you communicate. And so if that's through sign, if that's through an augmentative device, if that's through approximations, if that's through gesturing, there's ways to look at that. But that, that I know that a lot of, of parents, that was one thing that they talked about is, you know, increasing communication and what to do. And really looking at those assessments to see what is the best approach. What is the best approach? Is Because I think now the topic is, you know, everybody needs an iPad and everybody needs, but for some of our students, that isn't the most effective way. Um, it, it might be for some, but again, not that whole one size fits all. So that assessment and their strengths, what they're able to do, can they recognize those pictures? Because if they're not recognizing those pictures, why are we using those pictures? I mean, so there's a lot that goes into determining what should we be using to help build communication. Yeah, I was curious on the uh, the slide with the grocery store, the do's and the don'ts, and uh, I believe one of the things was uh, after you've you know got control of your child to go ahead and leave. Why would you go ahead and leave and not go back to to shopping? This is an example of a true emergency situation where they have totally lost control and going back in could trigger it to happen again. So this is, this is like the worst case scenario. Um, now, if, this, if a child is able to get themselves together and calm down, you know, in the car, again, it's individually based. I mean, it really is. But I know that we've had kids that have left, like they're working on, say, at Gymboree, doing a class for social skills, and they've darted out and maybe just sitting in the car for a while regaining themselves and then going back in was effective. But uh, what we see sometimes with what has been shared in some scenarios too is that what happens is our adrenaline gets pumping and our heart gets racing and sometimes that emotional piece, it's just too much. It's just too much. It's like we need to de-escalate ourselves. I mean, I know when I run an intervention that's really intense, I mean, my body goes through that adrenaline process. And so personally, I would not go back, you know, if that were the case, if it was that intense. But again, it's, de it's dependent on their, their ability and what they're capable of doing. So it's hypothetical. This may be silly, but the example where you said where they're watching the TV show jumping up and down, mm -hmm. why would we want to stop that, like future-wise? Why would we stop it? Again, this is going to be based on... It's not like saying, like, I'm just jumping down because I'm excited just for this, and then I'm going to stop. This is a true, it's repetitive, repetitive. They may be repeating and watching the same episode or the same scene over and over and engaging in that behavior. What we want to teach them to do is to be able to express, I like it, I'm happy, and, to, and that's one thing we could have added is to redirect them to either say something about what they're watching or to express they're happy or use their device to say they're happy, but to be able to communicate that feeling and enjoyment. Um, and also, if, if they're doing that, let's say hypothetically in another environment, then that could be preventing them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I know that's a different example, but the main reason is we really want to increase appropriate skills. So instead of doing something that is not, you know, geared to acquiring some appropriate skills, we want to find, let's teach some ways to do. Okay. Um, my question is regarding one of the scenarios, too. You talked about how you wouldn't want to do, like, if you come to the table, then you get an M&M. &M. And then if they don't do that, would you remove the, the reinforcer, like the, the M&M, because &M, they didn't come immediately? Because you don't want to reinforce that they didn't come. That's a great question. Uh, That's a great question. Or what, what would you do? I mean, because then you said you keep the demand. And we have this exact thing with my son all the time. So it's yeah. like we've given the if-then statement, and he doesn't do it. Right. 
And so then I'm standing there with the then, <laughs> uh -huh. and he's not doing it. But Correct. then once he does it, he accept, you know, he expects it or something like that. I don't uh -huh. know. Is that reinforcing that he didn't do it? What I would suggest, and this is what we do um, a lot of times, is depending upon skills of the individual, once they get, say, to the table, then after they could do some easy, simple, sometimes it's motor task, like, hey, clap your hands. Hey, what's your name? What's today? Or it could just be, do this. If they just do one or two little simple things, you offer back the M&Ms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're looking for fluency, and that's, that is the truth. Um, he was asking that it, it, it's what are you wanting to reinforce basically you want to reinforce coming to the table and they didn't and so what you ideally want is that they do it when you ask the first time and that it's fluent and so when they do it so if I if I went ahead and reinforced after they didn't do it for five minutes I'm reinforcing it's okay not to come when called so that's why I suggested ask them to do a couple little simple things that you know that they can do and they're successful at doing then reinforce so you're not reinforcing the wrong behavior um, is this the type of uh, education or therapy that you can have someone or go somewhere for like an hour a week or is it something that they can teach y in school uh, I how does that what does that look like both, and depending upon where you live and what services are, are offered, but um, definitely school districts are using it more often because of the research-based methodology and that they are tied to use what is the current, you know, best practice. So yes, teachers can and should be, you know, implementing those strategies that are effective and research-based. Um, also, there are um, those who access clinics and they can go an hour. Um, my supervisor, she has some that come for several hours. Um, some that do play therapy, some that do social groups. Um, so it's just really dependent on, you know, what services are in your area and what do they have. But again, an outside clinic would probably do an assessment. And then that assessment, they would probably then at that point say, okay, I would recommend twice a week, this many hours. Um, that's what we do when we go into the home for consulting. We do an assessment, and then we come back in our report and our results saying, all right, we need to do some, you know, intense, we need to be here, you know, three days this week or for the next three weeks, and then we'll reduce to two days, and then we'll do parent training as well. So it's going to always depend on that assessment, but it can be in both settings. Mm hmm um, with siblings, right, you know, especially younger ones, I actually have twins, so they're the exact same age. Uh, what point do you kind of engage them? Because, you, you know, if, if I feel terrible sometimes when I accept something from my PMS son and I don't accept it from my other son. So, you know, is there a point where they could also get trained? Like, is there training for siblings of kids with this? That is a great question. Um, my mentor, who I did my coursework through, Dr. Vince Carbone, he did actual research on, yeah, how you, we start training, whether it's peers and general education, and girls are great because they're usually mature and they like to play teacher, so they're all like all about it. Um, but yeah, you get, you, you almost start training them that, you know, to repeat and model what you're doing. And then as a result, when they're doing that, maybe they earn something fun, you know, in their life. Um, and so what I would suggest to get that kind of going is like start with fun activities, pair them doing fun activities together. And so the more that they're doing some fun activities, then maybe you say, oh, you know, can I have this or let's do some turn taking. So then you start kind of start building in some of those, ooh, ooh, he may not comply, you know, but we start out doing something fun. We're paired up with good things. Maybe the sibling is giving them the treats. So it's like, ooh, you're good. You're the fun person to be around because when I'm around you, life is good and good things happen. So yeah, that's a great question. I know someone else. Hi. Uh, so we've been receiving ABA services for a couple of years now. Um, and it's been delightful. I mean, really, it's made a real big difference in our lives. But I think, uh, at least in Michigan where we are, most of that ABA is delivered by tax as opposed to BCBAs. So we have a BCBA who's overseeing a behavioral tech who's, you know, coming out to deliver our services. Um, and they've been unbelievable. But I'm wondering if there's a 
gold standard or anything we should be looking for as far as how techs are accredited, educated, um, or even just communicating with other people, because I don't know about other people's experience, but sometimes we have like multiple folks rotating in, yeah. and that information sharing gets really, really tough. Yeah, so yeah. just anything you could speak to in that regard. Yeah, so the registered behavior technician is fairly new in our field. Um, I would say, let's see, about mm, maybe about five years that the techs have been around. And so that's just a different certification in our field, and like you said, they are supervised. Um, if you have the same one that's consistent, that'd be great. But if they are rotating, you know, that you're going to lose consistency in your programming. Um, what I would recommend is, um, do y'all do any monthly meetings where the BCBA is involved or the group? So we get in-home services during the school year, and then now during the summer, we've been trying to... We're not at school, so it's not as social, so we try and go in the clinic a couple of days a week. Um, when we're at home, we usually have a B the BCBA come out maybe once a month. Uh, when we're at the clinic, it's harder to know what exactly is going on because they're not calling us in. I mean, we communicate when we drop off and pick up, but we often don't see that BCBA. Or, I mean, I think they're having more interactions with other text kind of informally as mm -hmm. people are going to the playroom or circle time or whatever. Um. Another uh, suggestion could be that someone's a note taker. And it, through that meeting, these are the topics that we discussed. This is what we're going to be doing differently. Uh, we're changing up this reinforcement. We're adding these different skills to work on, you know, that we're targeting. And so then those notes need to be shared and, and maybe even that they, you know, initial and say, yes, I looked over, yes, I read it, yes, I'm aware, because everybody ne then knows, okay, we're all on the same page, these are the things that we discussed, so if it's somebody different, you know, you're still responsible to, to do that. Um, and, you know, just, I would, I would recommend having a conversation with your BCBA and sharing those concerns, and hopefully they'd be, you know, willing to work on making it better and just, because it's okay, I mean, to share that, you know, this is great, and you did a great job saying, you know, for the most part, everything's positive. And so, but, you know, these are some things that, you know, would be better if we could make these little tweaks in the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, a question about, in the ABA field, is there differences in specializations, like our kids have a lot more of sensory behavior mm -hmm. issues? My son in general does a rumination, so when he's not getting enough sensory input, he regurgitates food and, and do, uh, and then he's very loud, you know, whenever something's going on. Do you have, like, specialized type, or they, is it a generalized thing? Like, would ABA be something that can help him figure out why he's ruminating and a, and a, and a reinforcer to maybe have him stop doing it because he doesn't do it when he's getting a lot of stimulation, like yeah. in different environments and stuff. So. Yeah, I would suggest, um, okay, so in a school district currently? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, have they ever done, are they seeing it at school, the behavior? Yes. Okay. Have they done a functional behavior assessment? No. Okay. I would start there. Mm -hmm. Ask for a functional behavior assessment. Um, um, I, and say, you know, as you know, a parent, I'm really concerned about this. Um, and that, and so an assessment then should be looking at that and also share that, you know, you know that you want them to be aware, you know, yes, there's some sensory things going on here and share the history with that. But it needs to be based on assessment because like you said, when they're, if, if he's getting a lot um, of stimulation, he's not doing it. So figuring out how do we get a more stimulating environment throughout the day and, and recognizing that and making changes that this is what his day looks like, this is what, he, you know, that is specific for him to keep that behavior from occurring. And then of course, there are schedules, what we call schedules of reinforcement where you're getting reinforced because you went so long without engaging in the behavior or we just could like Wendy said catch you being good but there should be some schedule of reinforcement because we want to motivate him to know that you know life is good when you're not doing that behavior and hopefully that will decrease Are there any special considerations for ABA for older children? Are there any skills that are easier to tackle? I mean, this is a child. 
about our child who has had ABA in the past, on and off, and the school is ABA based. So, and we did have the f the FBA, mm -hmm. not uh, not the what we have analysis, analysis, not assessment. So maybe if you could also yeah. touch on and how old, what age? Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. So um, as far as looking at the skills. Also, we, we, had, um, we were talking about different assessments that even teachers do. At 15, you know, the programming starts looking differently. Um, sometimes it's less academic based and more functional based, more independent living skill based. So um, instead of, you know, and I'm, and I'm just doing a hypothetical here, is that instead of still working on shapes and counting coins, that, you know, that we can move into different things to teach with ABA that's more appropriate. Still using good teaching strategies like pairing it with reinforcement and, you know, um, you know, keeping the demand, um, fast-paced teaching. I mean, there's just a lot of good teaching strategies, but I, I do get there's a shift of what those skills should start looking like as their age starts changing. Um, how would you handle uh, behavior such as, uh, like, screaming uh, when they're not supposed to be doing that? Well, and like I said, unless I directly observe the situation with the child or young adult, I really can't say because in the presentation I talked about screaming could be functioning for different reasons. So what I would suggest is to start looking in the environment at what happens before the behavior occurs. A lot of times what happens right, and when I say before, I don't mean like five minutes before or an hour before. I mean literally the second before the behavior occurs. It's what we call an antecedent. Um, or, and so a lot of times if you can see what is happening before that causes that, it'll start getting you to start thinking like, hmm, why am I they be doing this? Could this be because it's an escape? I asked them to do something. Was it because I was talking to somebody else and they're trying to get my attention right now? So you just start hypothetically thinking, look at that environment, even take, t write it down. You know, on the phone, I was on the phone with someone and Johnny started screaming. Um, we asked him to put his shoes on, Johnny started screaming. Just start taking those notes so you can start seeing those patterns of when it's occurring that would will help you start understanding a little bit of maybe the whys. Uh, so let's say that they just kind of drop something. Mm-hmm. Let's say it's that. Then, then how would you handle that? So I would use the scenario of, uh, <coughs> well, you got to look at ABA is not just treating behavior. Okay, ABA is not just treating. You can treat behavior till you're blue in the face, but unless you also increase the appropriate behaviors and reinforce those, it's not gonna work. So when Wendy used the example, and I'll just go back to the example we had up, is that, you know, mom's on the phone and the behavior occurs. And so they're screaming and the slide said, ignore. Well, that's right. So you would ignore in that moment. But what you have to recognize is, is that when teach when, right, strike when the iron's cold is, we've got to increase ways that they gain attention appropriately. Because right now, uh -huh. strike when the iron's cold is meaning basically when they're not engaging in problem behavior. So those are your teachable moments. Those are your teachable moments. When it's hot is when the tantrum's already started. The throwing has already started. That's, that's when it's hot. The cold is when they're on. They're being good. They're just being themselves. They're, you know, complying. So that's when you want to be teaching, okay? So if you need to teach ways to gain attention, that's what you want to, you know, look at times, you know, to go, okay, I want to teach him how to, you know, whether it's saying your name, if it's tapping on the shoulder, if it's using a communication device, but looking at ways, because again, ignoring the screaming every time it happens, the behavior is not going to go away. I mean, that's, that's the way you treat it consequentially, but it's not going to make the behavior go away until we start teaching them a way to do what, you know, to get attention appropriately and we reinforce it. We got to, I mean, reinforcement's huge. And I find myself, I don't reinforce enough. I've watched videos of myself and I'm like, I went way too dang long without reinforcing because we just get caught up in the moment. So. Would you repeat that, please? <laughs> do you, you know what I mean? Like, so the kid's screaming and you want them not to scream, you put an iPad in front of them and you do it a number of times, now you've reinforced that. So when he wants the iPad, he screams. Correct. That's what we call a maladaptive man. 
Yeah, so we're we're doing things like that and reinforcing those behaviors. So I, I guess my point is, is you're saying try to teach different ways of and maybe asking for it correctly. But also you can also look at ways of when they're not screaming. I mean, it could be literally two seconds. I mean, it's dependent upon the individual. I mean, you can't just go, I want to wait, you know, a whole minute before they're quiet and give them the iPad. But we've literally, I've had, I've had staff just turn around and we count one, two, three, they're quiet. Boom. Now you get it. But good, okay. good job reflecting on knowing that, yeah, I mean, we call that a maladaptive man, which is a request. And so, yeah, I scream now, and I know I get that. And I did that in my classroom early on in teaching is um, they screamed. I let him go jump on the mini tramp because he hated my circle time, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> so every time it was about to start circle time, he would scream, and then he got to go jump. <laughs> okay, this is the last question. Would you, well, just to follow up with that. Mm -hmm. Would you give something before you got on the phone explaining that you are on the phone or you're going to be on the phone? Would that help? Yeah, Is that's that what we call, that's that proactive. Like, if you can be more proactive and say, all right, mom's going to be on the phone. If you can be quiet, you know, while I'm on the phone, you're going to get your iPad for 10 minutes. You know, because that is a great example of strike before. That's the striking, you know, when it's cold, is that if you can say it. We also call, if you're familiar with social stories and, and doing social stories with um, kiddos, is that social stories should be, yeah, sitting down and maybe talking about when mom's on the phone, these are the things I do. You know, and maybe you take pictures of those things, or if they read that, or if it's um, that they listen to a story, you know, a recording of it that says, okay, this is a scenario when mom's on the phone, I can play with a puzzle. I can do this. I'm going to have a quiet voice. It makes mom happy when I have a quiet voice. Sometimes when I have a quiet voice, I get my iPad or I get my M&Ms. So you're saying do the social story immediately before so yep. that they hear the That's whole right. scenario and play it out. That's Role right. Play, yeah. You're preparing them. Okay. Great questions, yes. all. Really good questions. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I hope you check out their website, and um, yeah. the best to you. Thank you.